if I don't know which way to go, what do I usually end up doing? Going nowhere, yeah. So there are times that Satan, perhaps he wants to deceive us and get us down the wrong road and doing and reacting to something that's not true. But sometimes Satan's deceptions are, to, are just to get us to simply stop, not do anything, not go anywhere, uh, get us to stand still, or just to make us afraid, to get our mind and our eyes off of what they need to be on. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, account of Peter's life gets used all the time, but when Peter, one, has this account where he gets to walk on water, I mean, that's an incredible act of faith on Peter. He jumps out of that boat. No one else does that. But after he's walking on water for a few feet, what happens? He sinks. And why does he sink? He took his eyes off Jesus. And once he begins to see that what's going on around him, he's, his faith falters because he's seeing more what's going on around him than he is his Lord. This is what Satan does. Um, he confuses, he gets our, our, our mind's eye, if you will, off of where we're going and who we're supposed to be following, and he gets us distracted by these other things, and then we're in trouble. And so Paul was saying to the third church of Thessalonica, you, you've been confused. You have, you have false teachers telling you things, and, they're, and now you're kinda, you don't know what's happening, you don't know where what's going, you don't know what's true, what's not true. And Paul's saying, I've told you this, don't believe somebody else. Here, here's, here's the truth. So, uh, and I think he could tell us the same thing today. As we read this, he's going to give us some information. Now, there's also going to be some information he apparently told the Thessalonian church. He said, y'all know what I'm talking about, but then he didn't tell him, he didn't tell us. <laughs> so he says, you guys know what I said to you, and we're going, uh, I don't know what you said to them, but he doesn't tell us. Um, but he goes, he would tell us today, listen, you guys have what you need to know. Now, where we get in trouble sometimes is by trying to fill in the blanks that God hasn't filled in. Uh, sometimes we get in trouble by going, um, is this true or is that true? Or we get ourselves confused and then we just don't do anything with it. Then we don't know anything about it. When there are some, th some things, in fact, he does tell us. So, we shouldn't be a, again, we talked about this quite a lot the last few weeks or before. We shouldn't be a panicky, loss of composure type of a people. We should be sure what the Lord has told us. Now, again, verse 2, they seem to be in a f really dealing with this idea that maybe Christ has already come. So they're concerned about, ultimately, some things we're concerned about. When is Jesus going to return? And what's that going to look like? Uh, when's it going to happen? What's all, what's all this going to, to, to deal with? By the way, there, are there any groups today that claim Jesus has already returned? There are, actually. You've probably had them knock on your door. Jehovah's Witnesses believe he came back in 1903. They've actually had several dates for his return. Um, but there are groups going around today saying this has already, ta already taken place. Uh, so, so verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. Now, the it will not come, what's he referring to? Yeah, the day of the Lord. He, this, in the verse 2. And we looked at this in 1 Thessalonians again. We, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the day of the Lord and what that meant. And we, we recognize that the day of the Lord, as Paul would have used it, the day of the Lord is a, is a reference that you see several times in the Old Testament scriptures that talks about that day when God wraps everything up, if you will. It's, it's the day when God comes and judgment is, is, is meted out and everything's wrapped up, so to speak. It's a day of, uh, when you look at the prophetic scriptures it's a day of judgment it's a day of darkness you get the you have various descriptions to talk about you know the moon, the moon turning blood red the sun being darkened it's it is that end of the world apocalyptic stereotype day that is the day of the lord now we talked about this at first thessalonians talked a little bit a little bit last week for paul it appears as we walk through this that the gathering of the saints and the day of the lord are kind of grouped together now, I've, I've told you uh, in the past, and 
lots of there's lots of debate on this not everyone agrees i'm in the camp that feels that the what we call the rapture the taking up out of the church and the return of christ the day of the lord to me i believe they all happen essentially simultaneously i do i do not believe that there is for example a rapture and then seven years later uh then christ returns i believe that those two events are actually uh, joined together now people disagree on that just let you know that's where i'm at on that i believe paul even this passage of scripture is putting those two things together as he did in first thessalonians now he says here uh that the the day of the lord that final day what we make of call christ's return that day of judgment will not happen unless so if we just stop right there what is paul telling us about the return of christ Something else has to happen first. Now, we understand, as Christ has said several times, we don't know when he's going to come, and when he comes, it'll be like a thief in the night. We won't, we don't, we, it won't be something we can predict. However, the Scriptures do say to us there will be some things that happen first. Now, that may mean I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know it can't happen before that. So Paul says here very directly, the day of the Lord will not come until. And he has two things he puts in here. He says it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So he has two things that have to take place before the day of the Lord. Christ's return in judgment. So let's look at these two things. And first of all, we're going to spend some time tonight looking at what he calls the apostasy. Now, apostasy is probably not a word we go around using a lot. (laughs) So when we talk about the word apostasy, what does that word mean? Anybody have an idea? Rebellion. That's exactly, that's actually like the Greek definition of the word. (laughs) So, Apostasy in general Greek language, that's exactly what it had been used for. It, it meant a rebellion. Um, now, it's used that way in general Greek language. In New Testament language, it can be used that way. It's also used multiple times to refer to what we might think of a spiritual rebellion. In other words, the idea that there's a group of people who were in this camp and they said, no, we're going to turn our backs and rebel. When, when someone's apostate, as somebody that we believe has turned their back on the teachings of Scripture, or they've rebelled against, or they've turned their back on the gospel. So, uh, by definition, apostate is someone who has fallen away, has rebelled, has turned their back on, however phrase you want, whatever way you want to describe it, it's probably all accurate, against the Lord. So he talks about, it's, 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 a, it's a falling away, if you will. Uh, now, he says, the apostasy will going to come first. Now, when he's referring to the apostasy, what's he referring to? I want to take you to a couple different places. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, and I'm just going to tell you right now, we're going to be in Matthew 24 a little bit tonight. We're going to go back and forth. Uh, Matthew 24, if you are unaware, is a, is, Jesus has a lengthy teaching segment on his return in Matthew 24, the beginning of the chapter the disciples just point blank ask him what will be the signs of of the end of your coming at the end of the age in verse 3 of 24 and jesus between verse 4 and the end of the chapter it's a long chapter jesus gives a lot of detail and in verse 10 as jesus is describing the beginnings of the end um i want to begin in verse 6 this is a familiar passage he says jesus does you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars See that you're not frightened. Sounds like Paul a while ago, doesn't it? For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. See the words fall away? That's, 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 that's apostasy there. 
Um, so he talks about, Jesus does, that there will be a time when tribulation begins of the saints. Verse 9, uh, that he takes that you will, they will, you will be hated on behalf of my name. So he's saying the nations are going to come against you as my followers. And when that happens, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets, verse 11, will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Jesus goes on in verse 14 to say, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So there's actually even right there another prerequisite, if you will, that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth before he will return. So that, that's an interesting thing to think about there, isn't it? So we have Jesus referring to, in 2410, apostasy, or a falling away. Let me take you elsewhere, uh, back to some of Paul's writings. Um, 1 Timothy, so that's just right after 2 Thessalonians. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, says this, The Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines and demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. So, you, I mean, Paul just warned them in 2 Thessalonians about Satan's deceptions, didn't he? So Paul's telling Timothy, listen, there's going, Satan's going to be deceiving people at the end, and the result is going to be that some will abandon or fall away from the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Also beginning in verse 1. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. In fact, there's a long list of these things through here. Um, and so, well, I lost my verse here. Well, he, he gives a whole list of things here about how folks have left the faith. I want to mention one more here. Um, oh, where did it go? Well, tell you what, there's also three places in the letter of 1 John, but I want to get to those later on. 1 John, uh, the Apostle John refers at least two or three times in that letter to those who fall away from the faith due to deception and their love growing cold. What we have here are multiple references in Matthew, the words of Christ himself, and in Paul, his letters, and ultimately in John too, where we have indications there will be a day near the end that one of the things that will happen is a, a falling away of a group of people who once had declared that they were followers of Christ. Now that, this is why Paul's saying, you guys have to be, <laughs> make sure that you guys know the truth so that you aren't deceived. Now this might be, on one hand, a bit of a, um, scary idea that there will be some who claim Christ who will in fact be deceived. Uh, in, in the Gospels, in fact, I believe it is Matthew 13, Jesus tells, we, we, we call it the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. You may be familiar with that. And the, the thrust of that parable is that there is a, a field and, of course, there is the wheat, the, the crops in that field, but there are also weeds, there are tares. There's, there's mixed in. And so the disciples ask, well, should we, the, the, the parable says that the, the servants say to the master, should we go out and pull out the weeds from among the wheat? And the master says, no, because what you'll do is you'll end up pulling up the good stuff with the bad, so just let it lie, let it be there, and at the end, we'll sort it out then. And he tells the disciples that it, this is what he's telling the disciples. This is what you need to do. Don't worry about right now, he says, pulling out the false from the real. There are going to be, Jesus says, false, I will not say false believers, but there are going to be those in the church who appear to be or claim to be genuine followers of Christ, but aren't. Maybe, maybe not. I would, you know, that, that's left up, that doesn't really say. It just says there are some who are real and some who aren't. 
And he says, don't get too obsessed about trying to nitpick every one. doesn't mean we don't make efforts to be truthful and, and do what we can to, to let I mean, people understand what's genuine and what's not. But he says, essentially, the, at the end, the angels will separate those two. Let, let, let them take care of that. So even in Jesus' parables, we have indications there are that there will be those who are, quote, in the church who aren't genuinely believers and that when, when, when the stuff happens at the end, when it gets tough, when the, when the persecution begins, when all this stuff happens, they will abandon and they will leave. Um, in fact, I mentioned first, let's just go ahead and go to 1 John, just, just so you can see this. The letter of 1 John, chapter 2. Um, First John, chapter 2, beginning of verse 22. John says this, who's the, who's the liar? Well, let me, let me go back. Verse, um, verse 15, 1 John 1, 15, 2, 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world's passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Children, it's the last hour. And just as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I've not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. So John's describing that there are those who actually were among them who not only have abandoned the faith, have not only become apostate, but they were actually, they're some of the false teachers. They're some of the ones in the name of Christ, in the name of the church, going out actually being the deceivers. Uh, chapter 4, same letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. Um, <clears throat> well, verse 1, actually. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you heard this coming, and now it is already in the world. So we have indications that there are going to be false teachers, false prophets, some coming from within the church that will actually lead some away into a falling away, and that this is one of the signs of the end times. Now, again, in 2 Thessalonians, there seems to be, he calls it the apostasy. That means there seems to be some indication that there will be, in those last days, a, more, a, a, a real spike, if you will, in this that there will almost be uh, a, a, a mass exodus. I don't want, I don't, I don't want to oversell because I don't know how many. I don't, know, I don't have a percentage. But there will be enough that you go, whoa, we, we've noticed. There will be a falling away, a leaving of the faith or a pursuit of a following of a false teaching. And, of course, John characterizes that false teaching as centered around the, the, the nature of who Jesus is. And this is, seems to be one thing that will take place in the last days. In fact, it's one of the signs that we're there. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, um, we have seen in the last 20 or 30 years, in our country in particular, uh, a significant decline in the number of folks who attend church or profess to be Christians. Now, I think a couple things are happening there. I, I don't tend to be quite as panicky about that as some do. Part of it's cultural. You know, there was probably 30 or 40 years ago people who didn't really believe, but they said they believed, or they just were raised in a culture to believe. People around them believed, their families did, so they just kind of did too. But they really weren't true disciples of Christ. They really weren't saved. 
the reality is in our culture today, there's not that pressure to say you believe whether you do or not. So I think part of it is that. But I do wonder at times, we do have a number of false teachers out there. We have a number of stuff if we're not seeing some of this, perhaps. Uh, now, I do want to caution us here on this. The center of Christianity in this world is actually not the United States. So we have to be careful in assuming that what's happening with the church in the United States is happening all over the world. Uh, Christianity, of course, you guys know, is a, is a global thing. We're, it's not unique to North America. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of stats about this I, found, I find interesting. Um, which of the, we'll, we'll assume Antarctica isn't on the list, so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go with six. Which of the six major continents, not by percentage, but by just raw numbers, have the most Christians, professing Christians on it right now? Africa, that's exactly right. Now this does include, I will say this, these, these numbers, uh, these raw numbers here do include Catholicism, and I, I would have some qualms about calling every Catholic a genuine Christian, but for statistical purposes right now, if you include Catholicism, 667 million, and this is, this is as of two, 2020, uh, around 660 to 670 million Christians in Africa. Now, I will say this, it's mostly the bottom half. Uh, the northern half of Africa is mostly Muslim, so this is mostly the uh, uh, bottom one half of Africa. Um, the second most is Latin and South America, with 612 followed by Europe at 565. So North America is way down the list. Uh, now, now, that's just raw numbers because the truth is Africa and South America are larger, more populous continents than North America is. That's also part of it. Um, by the way, just, just a little note here. Um, by the year 2050, the, uh, Africa is right now Asia is the most populous continent on the planet right now. By 2050, population experts will say, say or Africa will have passed them up. In fact, between 2020 and 2050, Africa's population is expected to double. Now, that's, a, that's a massive number. The average age of Christians, in, as of 2020, the average age of Christians in Africa is 19. So it's a young Christian population in parts of Africa. Now, if we narrow that down to Protestants, <laughs> um, still the continent of Europe has the most Protestants by percentage. The United States does have about 20% of the world's Protestants. But the highest density of Protestant Christians in any one nation is actually in Nigeria, in, in Africa. Um, and as far as raw numbers go, um, China has more. Has about China, would you, would you be China and Nigeria, India, Brazil, these are four of your most populous Protestant just from raw numbers. Uh, not the United States. Now, why do I bring all that up? One is to say this. We tend to look at end times events. That's what's happening in the United States. But understand the United States is not the center of the Christian world right now. In fact, we're way down the list. There are actually other parts of the world that have more Christians and even more Protestants than we do as a, as a, as a, as a culture. doesn't mean they have more as a higher percentage of the population, but there are more raw numbers elsewhere around the world. In other words... There are Christians everywhere around the world, and uh, when we get to heaven, we're likely to find out that English isn't the main language. <laughs> I, I have no idea what language we'll be speaking in. Maybe Hebrew for all that. Maybe we'll, learn, maybe we'll all learn Hebrew. I don't know. Um, but all that to be said, um, there are lots of Christians around the world that aren't here. Um, I speak I speak of Africa a while ago. Um, in 1900, so 123 years ago, 
Africa had 1.6% of all Protestants in the world. So not, not, not a lot. In 2020, African Protestants represented 44% of all the Protestants in the world. Now, I know you go, wait a minute, aren't we going to Africa right now on a mission trip because there's lots of unreached people there? And Yes, but that's obviously quite frankly, it's, it's a Muslim country. That, that's the Muslim part of Africa. And, you know, there's like 0.1% Christians there. <laughs> so that's not part of the world where we're going where that's the case. But all that to be said, lots of Christians around the world. And so when we look at this, we have to make sure we look at it from a global perspective. He says there will be the apostasy. Um, expect it. Um, now, as I mentioned, that there will be those who claim the name of Christ who will fall away. Does that bring up other questions? Or what, or what questions or what concerns does that bring up? Yes, sir. Okay. One, can you lose your salvation? Are we talking about people who are saved who, in fact, actually literally fall away and lose their salvation? Now, I will say this. I think John answers that question. Well, if we go back to 1 John, look at how he describes these things in chapter 2. Verse 19, John describes these folks as this. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out. So John would seem to answer that the ones who were leaving weren't genuine they looked like it but they weren't genuine that that parable of the wheat and tares is one way to look at it i would also suggest that jesus parable of the four soils is another instructive helpful one of us jesus describes the the, the parable of the sower and the, and the soils and he throws the seed on four different types of soils the the hard soil the rocky soil the thorny soil and the good soil of course the hard one you know nothing happens at, happens at all there but both the thorny and the rocky soil, the plants initially grow, but they very quickly, for whatever reason, wither and die. They don't produce any fruit, and they're burned up. And the good soil is the one that produces uh, plants that multiply and, and reproduce. So of those four soils, only one produces the real thing. Two of them produce ones that, for a while, look like they're the real thing. Now, in, in, that, in that context, in that parable, if you remember it, the thorn in the rocky soil, what happens that causes the plants in those two soils to wither and die? So what was that? Well, yeah, but that's, he, he gives a couple of specific reasons. Yeah. Okay, the roots aren't good. Uh, the roots aren't good. But something happens to them that really makes it, kind of brings it all out. The, the, the thorny soil, the basis says, are choked out by the weeds, by the cares of the world. The rocky soil, he says, the sun comes out, he basically calls it difficult times or persecution happens, and they don't have the root system to hang in there and they die. So basically what happens is they're, they're, they are diverted by other, they're distracted by the desires of the things of the world, or difficult times come and they abandon the faith. Sounds a little bit like uh, what Paul's talking about here. In other words, things get hard and some leave. Now for others, you could say things get good. They get, they get distracted by all the stuff they want around them. They, there's things they want. They get distracted by that. Either way, they abandon the faith. And John would describe them as they were really never of us. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, uh, <clears throat> Paul says it here, John says it, that if you want to know who's genuine, look at who lasts. So how do we know who's a real believer and who's not? Well, maybe not, not, maybe not in the short term, but over the long term, how would I find out? 
the ones who are still there 30 or 40 years later. Uh, the ones who hang in. Now, I'm not saying we may not go through periods where we're not hanging there very well. I, I don't mean to say that, you know, over a 50 or 60 year period, we may always be right where we're supposed to be. That's not my intention. But one of the signs that someone is genuinely born again is that they will endure. Um, so in the short term, it may be near impossible to tell. Uh, the truth is someone can look the part for a year, two years, five years, ten years, perhaps even. Uh, now, if this, you may be going, this makes me nervous. <laughs> well, on the one hand, okay. If it makes you aware of, of, a, of a need to be genuine in your faith and to really check your heart before the Lord, fine. But also recognize that First John talks about, in the end, that the core of this is, what do you do with Christ? Who is he? John talks about a couple things. One, is he the Son of God? Was he also in the flesh? It centers around Christ. In the end, we can talk about a lot of different things when it comes to Christianity. We can talk about different denominations. We can talk about how we live our lives. In the end, John would boil it down to this. What do you believe about that one guy called Jesus, the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Is the gospel true? Now, there's ways to look at that, ways to test that. But in the end, it comes down to the understanding of who Christ is. And someone can be wrong on a lot of other things, perhaps. <laughs> but if they have genuinely placed their eternal destiny, if you will, trusted their life to the person of Christ, believing everything the Scriptures say about Him, everything He said about Himself, I would, I would imagine that you are in this group that's lasting and enduring. Um, now, how do, you know if you do, how do you know if you're in that group? How would the Bible say, how do we know what we believe? fruit yeah we can say all manner of things about what we believe what we do how we live what our lives look like will always tell us what we really believe and sometimes our lives will tell us that we don't believe what we say we believe <laughs> and that, that in the end that's what we're talking about here when when persecution shows up do you believe the gospel uh, when temptation to, to, to riches or the things of this world show up, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe the words of Christ? Do you believe, who, you know, and if you're over here wandering around doing your own thing, you can say you believe whatever you want to believe, but your life will say something different. Now, I am not preaching tonight salvation by your works, by your deeds. But what I'm saying is this. The scripture is actually pretty clear on this one. Genuine conversion genuine rebirth genuine faith always produces spiritual fruit it always does and the genuine fruit producers will endure so the apostasy will be those who perhaps have looked like it for a while but they don't endure or when the pressure comes for whatever reason, they will abandon or they go into false teaching or they even deny some truths about Christ. But there will be an apostasy. And we have seen, even, over, in, even in this country, over the last, I'll say five to seven years in particular, a number of, of folks who I would put in that category of fairly well-known Christian teachers, some of whom have made a pretty big deal about doing something called deconstruction. And they talk about, well, you know, I'm not too sure about the church and I'm, I'm going back and I'm, I just believe what I believe because of all the, you know, that's just what I was passed down and the church is racist and all this stuff. And I'm going to go back and deconstruct my faith and it's a bunch of hooey. It's not really a Greek word, but I'm using it anyway. <laughs> um, and so we've seen some of those individuals, probably perhaps more in the last few years than we have in the past, who have gone back and sometimes very conservative 
Bible teaching guys who I, I'll admit sometimes there's some I've listened to from time to time who have now recount who we've recanted their faith. Um, or some who haven't necessarily openly recanted their faith, but they're now veering into false teaching. This is, I have to admit, this is this is the one that probably frustrates me more than even someone who just recants their faith. At least that person is being honest about it. I go, okay. It's the ones who start embracing clearly false teaching while still trying to be Christian at the same time. Those are the ones that I find really annoying. <laughs> and those are happening. Uh, you see often sometimes that people burst on the scene as a, as a preacher or a teacher or a Bible study leader or whatever else. And then for the first five or six, ten years, they're great. And then they start veering off into some things. You go, ugh. And that's frustrating. But understand this is all to be expected. It's even a sign of the end. All right. I didn't think we'd get much past the apostasy. We will deal with next week the guy who's called the man of lawlessness. He's also called the son of destruction. And he's also called the Antichrist. And we will deal with him next Wednesday night. And we probably we may or may not deal with him all that we have to say about him. But we will begin dealing with that next Wednesday night. All right. Um, and then following it, two weeks from now is Thanksgiving Eve. So we will, uh, we don't want to think about Thanksgiving Eve, but we'll, well, that's Thanksgiving Eve is that night that the house begins to smell like Thanksgiving meal, perhaps. Uh, so some of you are going, yay. <laughs> All right. We're going to end up, if you're watching online, thank you for doing that. And I would invite you back not only next Wednesday night, but Sunday morning as well. Y'all have a good evening.